Please, huge round of applause to welcome our guest tonight, Ilka Panin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It, it really is a big, big honor. Um, before I came here, I looked up like who has who have been here, like standing on the same stage before me, and you have names like uh, Peter Molinex, uh, you know, the creator of the Populous, among many other great things. And I, I personally, actually, I probably spent good two to three years at least of my life on on that very game. So it feels incredible to incredible to be here. So um, it may surprise you, but uh, I'm actually not a game developer as such myself. So uh, I I can't program a, a game. I'm not an, an a graphic artist. I haven't ever designed a, a, a game. And, uh, and actually games uh, became a career for me by an accident. Uh, so most of my friends uh, at, at, at the university, they decided to pursue uh, careers in, say, investment banking. Uh, many of them actually ended up here. Uh, Others chose management consulting, and I was still the odd one out. And uh, how I actually ended up in, in games was that I, I got really interested in entrepreneurship. And I then stumbled to this group of people who wanted to found a company. And that company just happened to be a games company. And all of the other guys, they, all of them, they were like true game developers and creators. Uh, and they, and, and that was all they wanted to do, and they needed somebody to do everything else. Uh, and uh, these guys, they, they absolutely couldn't afford to pay any kind of salary, which then led to this fact that I think there was only one applicant for the job. That was me, so I got it. Uh, and they made me the CEO. And, and this is 16 years ago, and, and that's how sort of a, I, I got into this, this, this business. Uh, also, uh, the interesting thing about games, uh, at, at least in Finland that time, was that I, I felt that I probably spent uh, at least the first 10 years in my career like explaining to other people this sort of choice of, uh, of, of career, especially at sort of parties organized by family. So, you know, relatives would ask that, hey, uh, Ilka, so what is it that you're doing these days? And then you start to explain that, you know, I'm so super excited about this game that we are or our team is, is, is building, and then the question comes up, and they say that, hey, uh, so, okay, that's all great, but when are you gonna get the real job? <laughs> but, you know, thankfully that question hasn't appeared in the last two to three years, so that's, that's <laughs> the good news. <laughs> so, um, even if I, 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 really, I really do love games, and I love to talk about games, but uh, uh, since I, I, I actually am not the one who creates games at Supercell, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about games today. I'm actually going to talk about like what, in my opinion, really like fuels, fuels and enables the creation of great games. And to me, that is the people and, and sort of the culture that these people operate in. And uh, I, I do believe that we at Supercell, we have a pretty unique culture. So uh, today I want to talk about, like, first of all, like what led to the creation of this culture? What sort of the background? Uh, also, like what's great about that culture, but probably like most interestingly, like what are we, what's hard about the culture? What is hard about maintaining it, and, and, and what are sort of some of the challenges, if you will? And maybe, and then like, uh, then I'm going to very briefly talk about how do we see the culture, culture evolving. But so um, let's get started. So, um, but before I get into the uh, supercell culture. I think I need to give you sort of some background. So as I said, uh, 16 years ago, uh, so we started this, this, this games company. And, uh, uh, and uh, you have to like remember, so my background, so I studied industrial engineering at the university. So, you know, maths, physics, uh, production systems, some economics, but all of these uh, topics that uh, sort of uh, require analytical thinking and that, and, you know, that's a sort of a, is encouraged everywhere. Everything has to be uh, logical. Uh, and, and that really like uh, had a sort of big impact how, how I, I wanted to sort of organize the, organize and run the, the company. Uh, so uh, I would almost describe it like later on, 
it's easier to talk about it, but it, it, I would describe it as a need for control. Uh, so, uh, like, I tried to have a, like, a very organized, logical, well thought out system for every single thing in the company, including the, the creative process. So, whether it was like, how do we decide what new games to build, or uh, like, which games shall we continue developing, which ones shall we kill, and, and, and so on. And, and for every single question like this, uh, I, I always like, uh, I wanted to have a very clear, well thought out logical answer, a very well structured sort of a process. You know, we had the, and, and everything always looked great on, 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 on paper at, at, at those times. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, one way to uh, describe what we had uh, was, was this. So, uh, so up there, there was myself and, and, and sort of a, a few other leaders at the top. And, and that, what the light bulb tries to describe that is that, you know, we kind of thought that we have the vision uh, for the types of games that people want to play. Uh, we call it creative vision. And, and then we exercised what we call the creative control, meaning that everybody like underneath was there mainly just to like execute against this, this vision. And, and, you know, really like a building the, the type of games that we wanted to build and what we thought were best for the, for the players. And actually, like uh, at some point, we became quite successful. So we were one of the top developers uh, in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, my, my, the first company was called Sumea, and then they sold it to a company called Digital Chocolate, and it was a really, really uh, great time. And, and, and actually, like funnily enough, when the company like became more successful, uh, then we actually we start to hire like relatively quickly even more people. So uh, there was this like growth spurt. Then like uh, on on year one, I think we had like 40 people. Then two years goes by, so like all of a sudden we sort of notice that oh my god, there's like 400 people here at the company, and uh, and that made like everything more complex. Uh, so, like looking back, like growing so quickly, that was a mistake in itself. So uh, it's really, really hard to maintain the quality of the people when you grow so quickly. And uh, secondly, it, it's, it's hard to integrate those people to the culture of a company. And at some point, the culture of a company starts to shift. But then, uh, moreover, uh, we, we tried to, the way we tried to manage this complexity was that we, I mean, <laughs> Again, think, like, think, think about what I just said about trying to be very logical about everything. We tried to introduce even more process to manage the complexity. We introduced more layers of management so that we could just organize all the people in these beautiful little boxes and everything just looked really good again on paper. But like, what it really did is that it slowed the company down, it introduced bureaucracy, it introduced slowness to the point that at some point uh, the best creative people kind of got enough and, and they started to leave. And I, I want to give you guys two sort of uh, examples of these processes that I think they're sort of kind of almost the worst that we, we, we introduced to the company. The first one was like how we decided to build new games. It was called a green light process. So how do we decide like what to build? And, 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 and we had this like green light document. So what we would do is that, that they would force uh, a, 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 a producer and product manager from a games team to, fit, to, to uh, write this uh, relatively long document that first describe the market need. Why, why is it actually that the consumers want this type of game? What is the estimated market size? You know, what's our share? Then like, what is the game about? What's unique about it? Why is it different from competition? All kinds of competitor analysis, uh, of course, a budget, and then some kind of revenue forecast and, and, and so forth. And then uh, what was even worse was that we uh, required, like, like, like basically for your um, uh, green light document to have any kind of chance to actually finally get a green light for production, uh, what you had to do is that you had to like, uh, uh, get uh, a stamp of approval or recommendation from sales department, from marketing department, and, and, and from finance, and so on. And, and you can sort of guess the rest. So it leads to this like uh, design by committee. You want to do something that is everybody is okay with. Uh, and and uh, needless to say, that doesn't really like uh, 
lead to the creation of a best game, it, it doesn't like encourage any kind of risk taking. Because if you if you want to take risks, there's also, also always going to be that somebody who says that I don't believe in this, and then you you can't push it through. And and more than anything, this took a lot of time. So that was the green light process. The other thing that was equally bad uh, was uh, these product reviews, which I think we had on on monthly basis. Again, very well intentioned process. So uh, the, the purpose was to like give feedback to the game team like on a monthly basis and also like make sure that they are on track. Uh, and what the, how it went was that the game team would come to the meeting and then everybody would call in. It was a, like the meeting like grew bigger and bigger and there's more and more people who were curious about how the game was doing. And then the game team essentially would pitch the company, everybody else on the call and the meeting that why should it, the, the development be continued. And again, of course, the best games teams and, and who kind of understood the sales process, they would like pitch before this official meeting to these other key guys like separately. And, 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 and at some point I woke up and realized that actually like in any given month, the team is using at least one week of every, every single month just to prepare for this meeting. And because they're preparing for this meeting, they're not actually building the, the game. And, um, and when you sort of really think about it, like this type of very well organized uh, model uh, and hierarchical model, it, it, really, it, it, it really belongs uh, to an, ma sort of manufacturing industries, the assembly lines. So in, in this type of environment, like how quality is, is defined, uh, it's, it's, it really is about all about doing the same thing over and over again and no mistakes allowed. And, and, then you, and then it's in very, very stark contrast to like what the games industry is, is, is all about or any kind of a creative industry. So in fact, you want to innovate, you want to try different things, which by definition, it leads to making mistakes. In fact, I would argue that you want to make mistakes because if you're not making mistakes, it just tells you that you're not taking enough risk. So it's, it, it's everything is, 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 is contrary. Uh, so, uh, at some point they realize that, but okay, that this really doesn't seem to be a, a, a good fit. So finally, at some point, I realized that uh, in fact, games is a form of art. It's not a science. It, it, and it so sounds like a such a self-evident thing to say here, but literally it took us all of those years to, to, to realize it. And, and, and really it's like, it's the games as a business, it shouldn't be driven by processes, like no matter how well intended they are. And, and trust me, all of those processes we put in place, they're very well intended and we had put a lot of thought to them. But the irony is that despite all the thought that they had put to those processes, uh, I, I think those there that actually start to pre prevent any great uh, games and innovation coming, coming from the, the, the company. Uh, so uh, then I think it was just one day, it was probably like in the year, 2008, I believe. Uh, this was one day and, and somebody from within the company uh, sent me this presentation, this PowerPoint deck, and it was uh, from a company uh, called Netflix, which I'm sure all, all of you guys know. Uh, and obviously a company in a completely different line of business and, and, and not in games. But there was a few things that really impressed me about that deck, and the deck was about their culture, and I'm sure they had leaked it out on, on, on purpose because it was such a well-prepared presentation. But anyway, so they talked about this culture of freedom and responsibility. And they, what they said in that presentation was that instead like, uh, of trying to manage complexity by introducing process, manage the complexity by hiring better people and then trust those people. I was like, wow, uh, this, is a, this is incredible. Like why, I mean, because it was almost like the opposite of what we had, had, had been doing. And then the other thing that like really struck chord with me on, on that deck was that they, how they talked about the company that they, uh, that they did not want the company to be a, a, a family. Or, or like kids recreational club, as I think they're the exact words. They wanted it to be a sports team. And, and that was the other thing that really like stuck to my head. And, and I thought that, that if, if, if I'm ever gonna like establish or found a new company, I mean, this should be the, the leading, leading idea. 
I, I start to talk about this idea to, to, to some people um, who, who I knew and, and, uh, and who later on then would become my, my co-founders. And, uh, and we, we start to think about like, what if, I mean, what, what if you really would put together a games company like you would put together a professional sports team? So what would it actually mean? So, so first of all, obviously you wanna get the be all, all the, best possible, the best possible players to your team. Like in every single position, ideally you wanna have the best possible player, but that is not enough. These players must play very well together. They, and, and you know, you could almost like think that it's the culture that, that glues them together. Uh, also, I start to like find out information about like, how are the best uh, professional sports team run, like wh what type of a philosophy they, they have. And, and surprise, surprise, it turned out that many of the best pro sports teams uh, are the ones where actually the coach uh, uh, actually gives quite a lot of freedom to the players themselves and tries to encourage them to make uh, the decisions and involve them to, into the creation of the tactics and so on. And the other thing that was, is very, very clear uh, about professional sports teams is that the real stars are, of course, are the players. It's not the sort of the management or, or even the coaches in, in, in the vast majority of the cases. It, it really is, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the players. So then we thought that, okay, this, this sounds like a great idea, and we got all really excited about it. But then we asked ourselves, that, okay, so how, how does that change things? And the very first thing that uh, came to our mind was that, hey, uh, let's, uh, let's turn this uh, orchard, let's turn it upside down. I mean, what would happen if instead of a vision being uh, communicated top down, what if it was bottoms up? What if, what, if the, what if the real superstars actually would be the guys who, and the people who create the games, the game developers themselves? And what if the management and the founders and the leadership and everybody else was there just to uh, uh, make sure that, that these guys can focus on the actual creation of the games and essentially to make sure that they are as successful as, as, as possible? Uh, what if that was the sole mission of the founders and, and management? Get the best players, uh, or the developers in this case, create the best possible environment for them, and then just get out of their way and, and, and have these guys focus on their actual work and, and, and just create great games. Uh, we also start to think about a company as sort of a platform, like a, a platform that would enable these people to make the, big, make the biggest possible impact and, and, and just be, be, be successful. Uh, and, uh, and the other sort of thought that I have later on got on is, and I I've mentioned in, it in a few interviews, is that uh, actually like my, my goal at Supercell is that I, w I would like to be the least powerful CEO. And what I mean about that is that uh, the less decisions I need to make, it means that the more decisions the guys who actually uh, know, this, know, know these games the best, the more decisions they make. And the more decisions they make, because none of the decisions never come to the, to the other layers, it means that those decisions get made a lot, lot quicker. Uh, there's no appro uh, approval loops or anything like that. And, and it's quite likely that those decisions are also better because they are made uh, by the people who are closest to whatever is it that they're. They're, they're working on. And actually, in fact, uh, I would argue that, that the vast, vast majority of the best decisions at Supercell are made exactly this way. And those are always the best days at Supercell for me, is that I actually learn about something great, like much, much later than it has been decided. I mean, those always makes me so happy because that proves that the model is working. So that's what I mean. Uh, uh, about being the least powerful CEO. Also, um, one le uh, last note about sort of the role of the CEO. Uh, like the, the more time has went by, the less I believe in this concept of these like hero CEOs. And, and uh, it, it certainly isn't the, the case at, at, at Supercell. Like I, 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 I think people, uh, like lots of time, they're overemphasize that role. Uh, 
if, if I think about at least how we've sort of created our best games, I've played a very little role in, in that. It, 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 it in fact, like, uh, it, it, it really is all about these people who created these great games, and that has enabled the company to be, be, be successful. And uh, I, I think sometimes people sort of confuse these two things, so a concept of a leader and leadership, and, and they think they are the sort of the, the kind of the same thing. Because I, I actually, I'd like to think that at Supercell, everybody is a leader. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, at Supercell, we have uh, 200 leaders, 200 entrepreneurs. Uh, and, uh, and you know, these are people who don't need to be told what to do. I mean, they, they would automatically like ideally think what's best for the, for the company. And it, it may sound a bit idealistic or even naive, but that certainly is the goal, how, how we want to build the, the company. So um, you may have seen uh, this, this sentence before when it comes to Supercell. Um, so, uh, so the more we thought about it, we kind of realized that it, yes, it, it really is all about these best people. Uh, and, uh, and, and that really like should be the, the only focus that we have. Make sure that we get these best people and create the best environment. Later on, actually, we've decided to change this sentence. Uh, no, now we actually understand it's actually, it's not about these best individuals, it's about the best teams. Because we've noticed that when, when we put together these games teams, uh, it, it actually is, a, it, it's really, really interesting how, how, how you put them, them together because you may have like five amazing, amazing developers, but for some reason these five just don't work very well together. But then you change maybe two, to, to, to two out of the five members of a team and, and all of a sudden you have an amazing team. And it's, it actually it's interesting to talk to, uh, say for example, uh, uh, say coaches of say ice hockey about this, this, this thing, because I mean in ice hockey, uh, you, you, you need to put together these lines. So you have a collection of like, say 22 players and, and you need to put together lines of, of, of five, five players. And apparently in, in ice hockey, it's a bit of the same thing. So, so you, I mean, it's not that the best individuals uh, always win, win these games. It, it is the best teams and, and best lines uh, at the end of the day who, who, who win the games. And it seems that it's very much the same with, with how, uh, in, at Supercell how we, we create these games. We also decided that, that you know, we will just forget this idea that there would be some kind of magic formula or process or strategy about creating hit games. We, we, we decided that we are going to focus all the effort on this and on the environment, and then we'll just trust that you know, with enough time and, and with some luck, something great will, will come, come out of it. Uh, then later on, uh, we had this idea that, hey, let's call this uh, these teams cells, uh, and and, uh, and 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 they thought that uh, like how we should think about these teams or cells is that they are almost like startups within a startup, uh, so this like in almost like independent companies within the greater company, uh, and and then that is actually where the name supercell comes from. So it's just a, a merely a collection of these these cells. So the, the sort of the last sort of a cornerstone or, or sort of a key belief that we had was actually small. So uh, so we thought that okay, like I mean, it, it, we are going to create the, uh, games f for mobile and these other sort of uh, mainstream uh, uh, casual platforms. And and the great thing about these platforms is that. Uh, but a very, very, very small team can actually build a great game. It's, uh, you know, you don't really need all the stuff that you need, for example, when you're building a AAA uh, console or, or, or PC game. And what's great about small is that because you have so little resources, you're almost forced to focus. I mean, you have to focus on the essentials because you just can't afford to do everything. So you have to make these choices. Also, when you have a small team of five, which is pretty much how we build these new games, you don't really need management or process or anything. I mean, you, um, every, everybody can be placed to the same room. It's really, really fast and easy to communicate. Uh, and and uh, that just makes everything like so much more fun uh, and, 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 and uh, faster. Uh, and everybody can focus on the work rather than reporting to some other people how, how they're sort of uh, doing. 
So, uh, so we, we, uh, we, we got really uh, excited about these this, this thoughts. Uh, and, uh, and we also thought that, hey, uh, that if we think this way, there has to be a lot of other people, really talented people in this world who would think the same way. And in the best game uh, case, Supercell would become this talent magnet. So like, you know, like lots of talented people would love to join us uh, if, 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 uh, if we are so lucky that you know, we can afford to hire some, some people. So then we got started. This, I think, is from June uh, 2010. So there were so six of us uh, who, who, who started the, the, the company. And uh, we were sort of really, really lucky uh, uh, quite early on, a little bit later on in 2010, we were lucky enough to find some seed investors who also believed in, in, in our idea of like how we actually didn't, like when we kind of pitched the company to, to investors, I don't think we talked all that much about the actual games. We also talked about like what type of company they were about to build. And actually many of the, the investors that they got also came from London. So uh, uh, for example, London Venture Partners, I think we have David, David here uh, from LVP in the audience, uh, initial capital, uh, and, and then few Finnish angel in investors. And that's how we sort of got, got started. And that enabled us to hire a bit, bit more people. This, we had this room of like 30 square meters and I think we managed to fit like 15 of us in, in that same, same room. So exactly two square meters per person. I'm sure we violated all possible uh, employee protection laws and stuff <laughs> there. And at some point the, the least productive person had to be uh, moved away. That literally was my desk for, a, for a, I think a couple of weeks before we moved to the, the new, new office. But that's, that's from 2010, so actually not that long ago, if you if you think about it. And uh, yeah, uh, so uh, this is uh, us us today. So of, of course, like uh, we've been like super 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 lucky. We've been able to put out these uh, four four hit games, uh, and, uh, and 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 even of course luck is is a big factor. We got started exactly at the right time and and, and so forth. But I do think that the other part of of, of, of like why we've been successful is actually how we think about sort of culture and, and how the company has been, been organized. Also, the one thing that I should say that I'm actually extremely proud of is that we are still uh, almost exactly just 200 people. And there's like 200 people may sound big to those of you guys who, who are running a um, small sort of indie, indie games development company, but 200 is way, way, way smaller than, than uh, I, I think any of, of our um, sort of kind of competitors or, or, or people who are on this sort of same scale on, on sort of user metrics and, and so forth. So like uh, we've, uh, we really like stuck to our roots and, and, uh, and, and, and tried to grow really, really slowly. And, and all of that is because of the previous experiences that they had at the previous company. So very proud about that. So I'll cover this really quickly. I think it's by now it's pretty obvious like what is great about this this model. So first of all, it's a, I, I do think it's super super motivating for the right right people. I mean, and and you guys are I guess most of you guys are game developers, so you would see see why. But it, it really boils down to this thing that you there's nothing really stopping you from being successful, and you can like laser focus on just building a a, a great game. And 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 yes, it really has attracted some of the world's best talent. Uh, to, to, to our studio in, in, in Helsinki. Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think we employ people in Helsinki um, for, who come from 30, so 3-0 uh, different countries all around the world. And, and I think roughly 60% of people these days who we recruit come from outside Finland. And I, I, I do think that the very big reason is that people uh, wanna just uh, try what it, it's like to work in an environment like this. Uh, one of the uh, sort of the, my best days actually at Supercell was that then one of these people like uh, described Supercell uh, as a like first company where he has like no excuses. Uh, you can't really blame processes or you can't really blame management for the simple reason that there is no management and there is no process. So really like uh, it, it, it's really all about you. And that really was like music to my ears as you can, can imagine. But this is more interesting, I'm sure. So what's been hard about uh, uh, like 
building this culture uh, and, and, and especially maintaining the culture. So there's many, many things, and I'll, I'll spend the rest of the uh, talk on, on, on those. Uh, so we, the first one is that there's this very big misconception about the model. And the misconception is that the supercell, it's just like uh, this one happy family where everybody can do like exactly what they want uh, without caring about the, the results. So you, just like this, like, like group of happy campers who get to work, they do something, you know, they, they uh, with the hoodies on and they party and, and, and you know, there's all of this uh, fun and joy and, and, and that type of stuff. And, and of course, like we, we love our work, we are really passionate about it, but we don't love our work because of the, the parties and stuff. We, we, we really do love the work, work part of our work. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the thing that some people don't realize is that the, I mean, the, set the bar extremely high when it comes to quality. And if something isn't working out, we will for sure do something about it. So uh, if a, for example, a, a, a project isn't working out, it's gonna be killed. And, and you know, we, we, we don't really tolerate average at all. In, in fact, we, we always, like whatever is it that we do, we always try to shoot for the moon, well know, knowing that most likely it's gonna be fail. And, and, uh, and but for, that, for us, that's, that's completely okay. We understand this, that, that if you are trying to like shoot for a moon, like in, and especially in the business that is as hard as games business, it's, it's quite, uh, it's not very likely that you will, you will, you will hit it, but that's okay. Uh, we also like how we sort of manage all of this is that, uh, I mean, I, I told you guys that we, I mean, everything centers around the, the creative game team, but yet, uh, we also like set targets. Uh, so, uh, for example, then we uh, launch a new game. Before the game goes out to a, what we call the beta testing period, we always set numerical targets, like what are the metrics that the game needs to hit. So we set targets on say retention, user engagement, and also monetization. Uh, and and we, we tell to the entire company what the targets are, so everybody knows. And then the game goes to beta, and if it doesn't hit these targets, the game will be killed, like no matter how much we personally would love the game. And we've done this number and number of, of times. Similarly, uh, we share all the information at the company. So every single morning, Helsinki time, when people get to work, they have this email coming to their inbox and it lists every single key performance metrics of the company, meaning the user numbers, the revenue, the sessions, the retention, you name it, on every single game, meaning that it's a completely transparent environment. I get the same email as everybody else uh, else do. And, and that is one of these glues that sort of keeps us focused and honest to ourselves. And everybody always knows like what is working and what's not working. And you know, it, it, it goes without saying is that, you know, of course it's fun to publish the metrics and things are going well, it's not as fun to see them when things aren't going well. And everybody knows that games business is full of ups and downs, so you will have those downs, and, and we've certainly had our share as, as well. Uh, so uh, so it sometimes it leads to also, I mean, cr to this creation of this relatively like high pressure environment. Uh, but, but for the right people, it's an extremely motivating and, and sort of also fun environment to be, be working at. The other, and, and perhaps one of the biggest challenges that they faced is that, you know, finding people, great people, uh, who are sort of fit with this, this, this type of model. So it, it goes without saying that this type of uh, environment, it's not really for, for everybody. Like in, in small teams, you know, you obviously need the people who can do almost everything. Uh, uh, you don't have the luxury to, to, to specialize just on, on one thing. So you need these generalists and, and, and you know, even in some teams we may not even have a game designer because the whole team is, is contributing to the, the, the game uh, design. Uh, also this, this whole transparency and high pressure thing that I talked about, I mean it's, it's not for, for everybody and, and, and you know, the fact that there is very little guidance and management uh, it can be stressful for some people. Uh, I mean, and because there isn't maybe that sense of like, uh, like control, with, which gives a feeling of safety uh, for, for a certain type of people. And there's, you know, there, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not just be, those type of people, uh, they, they are, aren't right for our type of organizational model. 
So just to give you guys an example how hard it is to find people for this model, last year I believe we hired six developers in total to Helsinki. So that's one developer per two months. Uh, and uh, and it, it is just tough. Uh, so that, that's certainly been challenging us to be, be honest. Uh, funnily enough, what seems to be contributing to like our hiring challenges is that, uh, that quite, quite a big number of people when we talk to them in events like this, for example, uh, they don't think that what I'm describing is true. They don't believe it. They think that, you know, that this is this sort of this PR story that they've created to help recruiting, obviously. And it has happened, like, trust me, number of times that there's somebody who's been with us like two to three months and I meet this somebody at the coffee machine and, and this person says that, hey, uh, you know, I have to confess that I, I actually didn't really believe what you said during the interview process, but it, ha it seems to be true. So, so and, and it's, it's, it's great, but, but that, that really like, uh, it, it, I mean, because we, I mean, we, we really are like, uh, we take this extremely seriously and, and it, trust me, it is true. Uh, but uh, you really almost like have to spend some time within the environment so that you truly appreciate how, how different it is. Uh, and there's one more thing that uh, it's not related to hiring developers. It's actually also sometimes hiring other people around the developers is hard as well. Because like at Supercell, the heart and center of the company are the game teams. So it also like uh, requires like the people around them have to be a certain type of people. So for example, you can't really be a sort of control freak or you, don't need, you can't have a big ego because the fact is that at the end of the day, it's the games teams, it's the developers who set the rhythm of a company. And no matter what is your title and they don't really generally even have titles, like you, I, mean, you, 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 I mean your mission like outside the games teams is just and solely to help the game teams and help the games that they make to be successful and of course serve our players. But that is your job. Uh, I mean, nobody goes and, and you know, tells the games teams what to do, like no matter what. And it, 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 sometimes it's, it's hard to, to find people who like truly like believe that's the right way to, 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 to run game, games companies. The other thing that's been hard and probably like even like personally I would say that this is probably the hardest thing for me is, is, is this notion of focus. And uh, we've learned the very hard way that, that focus really is not what you do, it is the, all the things that you say no to. And uh, because, as I said, like, uh, our teams are small, so that really limits like, uh, the amount of stuff that we, we can do. And you know, you can imagine like people like me who like, get very easily excited about all kinds of new things. And I, I, I feel that I have like 10 great ideas every single day. But at Supercell, I really need to say no to every single one of them every single day. And, and very, very rarely does it happen that, you know, that one of those ideas actually gets, gets implemented. And actually, like, at, at some point, we even, with a team uh, at Supercell, we, when we had some uh, challenges in focusing on, on, on certain things, we agreed that, like, okay, but from now on, like, the standard answer to everything is no. And, and, uh, and then maybe at some point, like, some of the best things will turn into yes. But, you know, that's how we're going to keep the, the company focused. We've also done these exercises like, uh, that, okay, let's think about, like, like, let's try to list all the things that they've said no to in the last six months, for example. And if there's not enough stuff in that list, people get worried. Uh, and uh, and it's, this is again like it de like demands a certain type of personality. Uh, and, and, but, but you know, again, it's, it's something that they've learned the very, very hard way. I don't even go, want, I don't even want to go to the early days when they got this like, completely wrong. We were just trying to do too many things. But this is really what enables us in our opinion, to deliver the best possible quality for our players. Because we do very few things, but whatever we do, we do to the best of our abilities. Of course, the, the other sort of a counter argument, of course, to this, by the way, would be that, that the other thing you don't want to do is that you don't want to become a victim of your own success. So on the other hand, if you, don't, if you always do the things that you've always done, like nothing new will happen and, and, uh, and, and then you can, so as I said, you can just be a, a victim of your own, own success. So it's always a balancing act, but still I, I think this is, has, 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 been, has been hard. 
So, uh, so we talk a lot about uh, killing games, and I want to just quickly sort of run you through one, one case. Uh, it's a game called Smashland, which was one of my personal favorites of the games that we've ever, ever done. It ended up being, being killed. Uh, so, um, so generally, we just kill a lot of games. So to give you guys an idea, so in the last two years, we released one game called Clash Royale, and I think we've killed nine games during that same time. So one out of 10 made it. And, and you know, these were not just some early prototypes. So many of these were very well uh, and, and or developed to a very advanced stage. And so why do we do that? So the one first obvious answer is that because we want the games to be best possible quality. Uh, but the other answer is that because we want to keep the company as small as possible. I mean, our explicit goal is to keep the companies as small as possible, just, but just big enough so that we can pursue uh, our, our dreams, but, but you know, as small as possible. And the problem, I mean, if we start to launch, if we start to lower a bar on quality, what we're seeing on the games, that would mean that we would need more people, of course, to maintain these games. I mean, in our business, when you release a game, it's not that you release the game and you move on to something else. No, I mean, you release the game and it's not the end, it's the beginning. That's when it all starts. Uh, and, and, and you start to like, you, you want players to come in, in, into your game and you know, and, and if players come in, it, you really owe it to the players to keep the game fresh, which means that you need to invest more to the game. You need to have player support to, to provide customer support for players. You obviously need to invest in marketing and so on, uh, in community, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and all of these take people. And, and you know, the way we think about it is that, that the only, the very best games deserve all of this. And we are not going to grow the company, which would force us to, force us to introduce new processes just to maintain games that are average. So that's, that's the reason why we, why we uh, kill these games. But about Smashland, so this was a, as I said, it was a turn-based uh, real-time uh, player versus player game that we, we, we developed uh, uh, some, some time back. And, and you know, the thing about this game was that everybody in the company loved it. It, it wasn't just me. And, and you know, it was really like uh, close to our hearts. I, 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 for, uh, I, for example, played this game a lot with my kids every single time I came home. And I know lots of other people did it as well. And the interesting thing about Smashland was that I'm pretty sure it would have been a top 25 game had we launched it at the time. Uh, and uh, it was so close to meeting our metric goals, but it didn't meet them. Uh, and uh, it got killed. And I thought that you guys might be interested to hear like how, how did that happen? And how does a decision, a really tough decision like this get made? So. Uh, so as all great decisions, of course, it gets made in, in, in sauna. Uh, so I'm sorry that I, I had to blur the image. It's, it's full of like naked men sitting on, sitting on outside, the, outside the sauna. Would have, have been a pretty, pretty sight. Uh, but anyway, so the team got together. They literally went to sauna and they decided. They, I, I think they had, and, and I wasn't part of the meeting, but what I, later on I heard that, that they had, had this really honest discussion is that, you know, if you could only develop one game for the next few years, is this the game or is it something else? And after a long discussion, they had decided that no, it's not this game, we can do better. So they decided to kill it. Uh, and then they informed the company. And I'm not kidding you, but I was traveling. I, I knew that they were sort of thinking about this, but I was traveling when I heard about killing the, the game. Uh, so they didn't even bother to, to consult me, which is great. That's how Supercell should work. And then Jonathan, who, who was the lead of that team, he decided to email it to crew, which means everybody at, at Supercell. And I just thought it might be interested to take a, take a look. And then I thought, okay, maybe I should reply something. And so I did. Uh, but. Uh, this is how, how we, we like to do stuff. So, you know, when there's uh, bad news, uh, share them to everybody. Be honest, be transparent, share them as early as possible. Uh, and, and, you know, you know then, then move on. The most uh, beneficial part of this process, however, is this. So, uh, so we, we do try to share the learnings. So this is, is photo of Jonathan 
uh, every single Friday we get together with a whole company uh, and, uh, and this is where people give updates on what's going on. And he got up on the stage and, uh, and, and talked about like, you know, what worked in the game, what didn't work, what did they learn. And I'm sure many of you guys have heard about this habit, but yes, there it is, it's a glass of champagne. Uh, and, and at some point it started as a joke, but now it, for some reason, it has become a habit. We, we actually do celebrate this. Uh, uh, some, some people say that we celebrate the, the, the uh, failure. We actually don't. We celebrate the learnings from these failures, and, uh, and we, we sort of think that they are so valuable that they're worth uh, celebrating with, with champagne. Uh, it's, it's sort of a funny, funny story, but um, we, we made a sort of a big, we had a big sort of breakthrough moment. I think it was two years ago at an offsite. So, so this has been part of Supercell, I think, the last maybe five years or so, the champagne celebrations of failures. But then during an offsite, like somebody asked a question in company Q&A that, hey, uh, I, I sort of get that we are uh, celebrating the learnings that come from these failures to champagne. But you know, we've been relatively successful, so it wouldn't it be sort of fun to celebrate these successes too? And the event that, yeah, it's a pretty good point. So these days when we have successes, we, we drink champagne as, as, as well. We just made life. That's a lot more fun, by the way. Uh, and, and you know, like, <laughs> even though I'm, I'm sort of uh, joking here, is that don't, don't be mistaken, is that, I mean, we are not trying to pretend that failing is fun, because it sucks. It absolutely sucks. Like, imagine, like, a group of people have invested, like, half a year or nine months or a year even, of their life to, to something, a game, game that everybody loves, uh, or at least the team loves, because they got that far. Uh, and, and they've invested so much love, energy, hours, uh, tears to the game. Uh, then you put it out. For some reason, players don't like it as much. It has to be killed. I mean, it, that absolutely sucks. Uh, but still, like, we wanted to create this environment where, where sort of, quote, failure uh, would be as safe as possible, and, and, and even more importantly, we would actually learn from these, these failures. Because I honestly think that Supercell, at the end of the day, it's been built on top of the learnings that come from these, these failures. And just, you know, uh, fundamentally, uh, we, we believe that quality is worth killing for. Uh, this is a nice sort of summary picture that, you know, as I said, we, we put out four games, which you can see there, so Clash of Clans, boom. Beach, Heyday, and Class Royale, and then with the tombstones, you have all the stuff that we've, we've, we've killed. Uh, but the, one of the thing, reasons why this is so hard and what is sort of challenge for us, like culturally, which was the topic, is, is that, you know, imagine that you are at Supercell for three years and you're a game developer, and none of your games that you touch on get released globally. And, and you know, it, it, it has happened. I mean, even though we obviously try to rotate people uh, between teams and so on, but if you're sort of really unlucky, uh, because we are in such a hard business, I mean, it, it can happen. And, and, and that obviously is, is, is not fun at all. Uh, this whole champagne celebration thing, by the way, it started from, from celebrating these killed games. But since then, you know, we noticed that it's such a good habit uh, to kind of share learnings that we've uh, started to do and apply it to other uh, uh, things as well. So like whenever there's sort of a big failure there, we can actually learn something. Say for example, a failed marketing campaign, uh, then we, we always uh, are very transparent about it and, and you know, toast, toast the champagne for, for the learnings that come, come from it. Actually, one of my best days, sort of, at, at Supercell was the, the day when, uh, when Smashland was killed, because the day when Jonathan gave that update, actually just uh, out of uh, uh, coincidence in that same update, uh, uh, the, the person who runs our marketing uh, globally actually gave an update about the marketing campaign that also had failed like miserably, like from financial perspective. And, and, uh, but, but, and, and after those two presentations, I just told, told our people that isn't this amazing? That you know, we've like really screwed up big time. And, 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 and here we have the leaders of those teams like, just, like completely openly talking about it. And, and you know, that probably wouldn't happen in, in, in that many companies. So made me made me pr very proud. Uh, 
And I, I think I already mentioned about it, but, but we just think that, you know, that failure is, it, it's actually is really important to fail. So one of my worst nightmares is that one of these days I'll wake up in the morning and I start to think about failures and then I think that, okay, I'd, actually I can't name any failure in the last year. I mean, that would be a disaster because what it would tell me is that we are not taking enough risk. I mean, we are not being brave enough. We are not trying new things because surely then you take these risks then you are, you are going to fail. I mean, that's by definition. And, and the risk taking is so, so important in our industry because without the risk taking, there will be no hit games. So it is really important that you constantly uh, keep, on, keep on failing too. So back to this idea real quick. Uh, so I already, already talked about. So uh, the other like, a very recent thing that we've actually had to say no to is, uh, is this thing. Uh, so it's, it's called ClashCon. This is an image from uh, last year's ClashCon. So ClashCon is this fan event we, we organized for, for, the, for the players. And, uh, and I have to say that last year we, we had uh, people from, I think, more than 33 countries, I believe, uh, who all traveled uh, to Helsinki to sort of uh, participate in ClashCon, uh, in Clan Wars, uh, just celebrating the games and just to have fun. Uh, like absolutely one of the best days again, like that I've had at the at the company. It was amazing to see the passion and the energy and how much people loved the games. Uh, the, uh, and uh, but this year, uh, a few weeks back, we, we start to have real discussions with both the Clash of Clans team and the Clash Royale team. And uh, the fact was that you know <laughs> that when we can really look through into the eye was that, I mean, we, we don't have resources to organize a really great ClashCon this year. I mean, we really need to focus all the small teams and the small resources that they have on the teams. We need to focus them on the game. We, we very much feel that these games, we can make them much, much better for the players that way. And if that means that we have to kill ClashCon, like no matter how much we and the players love it, at the end of the day, it's gonna be best for the games, and therefore it's going to be best for the players if they just don't do it. So we decided not to do it, <laughs> and uh, an extremely hard decision, uh, and, and which we communicated to the players uh, quite soon, soon thereafter. And, uh, and luckily, like a large part of them understood. But uh, but you know, it, it, it really like it's like one, again the, one of those decisions that, uh, that I think took a lot of guts from the game teams to decide that this is not what we're going to do. So what else is, is, is fun at Supercell? Um, so a uh, few, few more things I wanted to talk about. One is that uh, uh, it's a very sort of game team centric culture. I mean, that was why the company was founded in the first place. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. But you know, uh, in that type of culture, it's, it's sometimes surprisingly hard to like uh, achieve like consensus. And, 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 uh, and sometimes it, it, it leads to this incredibly heated heated discussions and, and uh, like uh, just a few examples. So, uh, so one thing that uh, is, is unifies both Boom Beach and actually Class Royale is that at some point uh, during the development of those two games, almost everybody else except these game teams uh, wanted to kill those games. So, so I literally remember this meeting with the Boom Beach team where we had like all the game leads from every other team in the room with the Boom Beach team. And every single person in that room, with the exception of the Boom Beach guys, wanted to kill their game. And, uh, and, and then I remember we were having this discussion that, okay, what are we going to do? So the consensus thinks that this game shouldn't be released and the project should be killed, but the team really believes in it. So what do we do? And, uh, and, and then in the end, we, there, where we ended up was that, that if we now kill this game. That is the end of Supercell because it means that the team in fact doesn't get to make the decisions. And so despite everybody else disagreeing, the team was allowed to continue and, and, and thank God we, we, we made that decision. And, and funnily, funnily enough, like Clash Royale, that was a massive hit when it, it came out. The exact same thing was true about that game. Like, like quite early on, like I mean, almost no one else except again the team believed in, in, in that game. And, 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 uh, and you know, these are the cases where our culture has truly been, been tested. 
also uh, we had a case uh, uh, some, some time back where we actually like a few years back there we were about to execute our first outdoor advertising campaign in, in New York. So I think we had bought a lot of media space from the, the New York uh, subway. Uh, and since that was the first time we were doing it, uh, we had no idea like what type of effort it would be involved to like create the, all of this high resolution material for the, these a a advertising spaces. And, and, and basically like what happened was that you know, we, we, we managed to get there in time, but then the deadline was there, the day came. The game team came to us and, and to the marketing team and said, hey, uh, this is kind of like, it, it's okay, but it certainly isn't great. We are not proud of this, and therefore we think that they shouldn't do it. And then obviously everybody else goes like, what are you talking about? We just paid a huge amount of money uh, for, for this campaign. It's our first one ever. I mean, you, you, you possibly can't suggest that we have to kill this campaign. Like imagine the, the amount of money that will just go, go down the toilet. Because obviously you don't get refunds uh, in, in this business. But then they say that, hey, like, uh, okay, well, let's go back to our values. Our number one value is quality. And, this, and, and the other value is that it, it's, it's all about the team. So uh, like if, if we now like, go and proceed with this campaign, it's against the culture. And then, yeah, as painful as it was to admit, I mean, these guys, they're right. The, the campaign was canceled. We obviously lost a lot of money in, in, in doing so. Uh, but again, we, we, we cons like thought that actually the culture is more important. Yes, in the short term, you know, we would have made a lot more money had we just put the campaign out, I'm sure. I don't think actually that many people would have noticed, except the game team. But, but you know, the team is so important to us and the culture is so important to us that we, we are ready to make these short-term sacrifices for the best, what is like for the best of, or what's best for the, the, the long term. But the story doesn't stop there. So in so many companies that I know, like that decision would have been like made quite silently and, and you know, it had been forgotten somewhere. But what happened was that the guy who, who again, like, uh, who was uh, responsible for this, like from the marketing side, the next time he, and he worked from San Francisco, the next time he came to Helsinki, what this, what the, what this guy did was that he invited everybody, I mean everybody from Helsinki, obviously, to this meeting, and like a place like this, and he presented the entire case to them, and, and he told exactly like how much money had been lost and you know, what they had learned from that. And again, it's one of those moments that you realize that, yeah, you know, there's something really special about this, what they, what they built. Uh, but again, like, uh, it's, it's hard, it's, it's not easy. Uh, the, the second thing uh, I'll just quickly mention is, is that uh, sometimes these game teams can also become a bottleneck. So if, if game teams need to decide and approve everything, then they've actually created the opposite of what I just told you guys about. So uh, actually, like quite, and this is quite recent, we've actually started this experiment there, which we call uh, a trust experiment, and which means that you don't need to get approval from, from anyone. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that also applies to the relationship with the marketing and the, and, and the games, games teams. So, uh, so that's sort of a, just to give you guys a glimpse on the, what's, I mean, uh, uh, about the culture. So like what led to the creation of a culture, uh, what's great about it and, and what's, what's, what's hard about it. Uh, so very quickly, like how do we see this evolving? So one idea that we've had for the future is that, you know, we now, by now we feel that we understand our culture quite well. So we understand the pros and cons well. And now we thought that, okay, what's the sort of, the, is there a sort of kind of obvious next step? I mean, where do we take the culture? And this one idea that we've gotten pretty in, like interested about and excited about is that would there be a way to somehow give access to this type of thing, thinking to more game developers like around the globe. And of course the bottleneck here is that not everybody unfortunately wants to move to Helsinki and live there and develop games. I mean, many people do, but not all the, I mean obviously not the, everybody who's part of the world, world's best talent uh, are, are willing to do that. So right now like what we are thinking about very actively and very interested about is to like look for other teams like in, in other locations 
who would be interested uh, in, in, in sort of uh, joining this type of an environment. And obviously, we feel that we have a, since we are able to make this work internally and we don't really mess with the teams, we believe that we can also make it work with the ex external teams. So that's something that we, we will sort of take, take this uh, forward to at some point when we find the right, right teams. So, uh, so sort of when I like ended this, 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 with this thought that, uh, uh, like the question that we get asked, and I especially get asked a lot, is that uh, you know since we've been successful, ha, ha, this, I, I get this question a lot. That hey, so uh, do you think that, that you guys can sort of sustain this this success that you've you, you've had, and and you know like do you think that the next year will be even better than this year, and and, and so on, and and. It, it really is interesting because like if I'm really honest to myself like like if I just think about the next year I mean do I know like what does the revenue and and, and, and what do the user numbers look like for the company next year and the honest answer is that no I don't I, I, I just I mean of course I could make a guess but but but, but the truth is that this business is so hard to forecast that I, I, I don't I, I really don't have any idea uh, so I don't know about the next year because for us next year that's short term. If somebody would ask me that, hey, how do you think the business will be doing ten years from now? I can say with an extremely big confidence that I'm sure it's going to be much much better. Uh, but like at the same time, I, I think uh, when you are in the games business, you should understand that it's the nature of the games business that there are these ups and downs, ups and downs. But if you take a longer uh, a perspective that is uh, long enough. Then hopefully, like uh, in aggregate, like things will 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 will, will go up, and, and you know, like the like, and these these sort of have built the, the supercell organizational model and the culture, like taking this into account. I mean, this is exactly how we build it. So this is why, uh, even if we are passionate about games, I mean, at the end of the day, like the most important thing about supercell is the people and the culture, because we just believe that. If we can, even if we can sort of like sustain that, nurture it, and make it even better, like then if you take a long enough perspective, like then more great gains will, will come out of it, and, and and these gains that can hopefully be part of the rich history of the games. So it's it's really is all about people. Thank you very much. Um, we should have about 25 minutes for questions, so I'll start with a couple, and then we'll open it to the floor. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about your, your personal connection with games, because we've learned a lot about how your company is structured and uh, how the games that, that are made at Supercell have, have become successful. But what was it that drew you, like as a, young, as a young person, what was it that drew you to video games? You mentioned Populous. Yeah, well, I, I think it's probably like uh, the usual story. So uh, like uh, many of my friends had like Commodore 64. My dad had actually, he wouldn't buy it for whatever reason, but he bought the, the PC, if you guys remember, the, the XT. Like this, like zero eight 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 processor with a beautiful like four color CGA <laughs> screen, and I, I you know I, I played all the games I could possibly possibly could play with that with that computer, and then of course at, at my friends and actually I, it actually it, it really got to this point that at some point like because the screens were so bad at the time that I I, I played so much that at, for some reason my my eyes start to sort of. Uh, Kind of flicker, and my, my mom actually took me to the doctor. <laughs> Say that hey, this guy is like just spending way too much time with the computer games, and uh, and uh, but I, I I played a lot uh, at that time. Uh, like some of my other favorites were like a bit later on their games. I, I always for some reason have loved like simulation games. So I mm. love Civilization, SimCity, um, those type of games. And at then at some point I got the, to the RTS games. So I played a lot. I played Dune 2 which I think was one of the first ones in the genre and, and those type of games. And then I'm a big sports fan, so I played a lot of like pro, -elo pro evolution soccer and, uh, and uh, uh, the NHL ice hockey games and so forth. Um, one of the things you mentioned that I think probably struck a chord with everyone in the room is the when are you getting a real job question, which I think every single person who's worked in games <laughs> on any level has had at least five years of that. Yeah. Um, so I think we can we can say now. I mean, as you alluded to, like games are understood as a business now. You know, when we're talking to, um, especially our older family members, like people understand that games are understood like as a business, as a viable business. Do you think they're understood culturally yet, or do you think there's still time before people understand it culturally? Well, I I, I think it depends a bit on on the country. So 
So I, well, <laughs> thanks to organization like BASTA, I mean, you, you guys clearly <laughs> under, understand it. But I think there's st still some way to go in there. I, I, I think it, but I, I think it's like, it's, it's slowly, slowly sinking in, in, in many other countries as well. But I, I think it's going to take still some, some time for people to like, truly appreciate it. Speaking of uh, local culture, uh, one thing that you tend to notice when you visit Helsinki and you, you look at the game dev culture is that the smaller companies and the huge companies tend to have a kind of communal approach. Um, how, how is the game development culture in Helsinki? How does it work? Uh, well, I, I think it, it's, it's fantastic and it's probably one of the biggest reasons for the, for the success of the whole, whole CDSA, kind of a, one of the kind of game development hubs, I, I guess, in, in the world these days. So it, it's a very like, uh, tight community. I, I'm not like uh, exaggerating when I say that it, it really is uh, like, a, it used to be a relatively small family. Now it's a very big, big family. And uh, just as a concrete example, for example, we, we still get together, like I think uh, every month into this what they call pub nights. I mean, uh, and and uh, well, you guys should appreciate that. But you know, uh, uh, like, uh, and, and then those started like uh, maybe, 13 years ago, I, I, I still remember we were able to like fit almost all participants around like one or two like bigger tables. And then I think last month, then we actually, it was our turn to organize it. I think we had like 600 people coming in. And, 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 and what's really great about the, the community is that nobody thinks our companies as competitors. Like, I mean, all information that, that can be shared will be shared and people are like helping each other out. And as you pointed out, like big companies are helping small companies. And, uh, you know, for example, like, uh, uh, like uh, you know, we, 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 we love to like uh, make introductions to like platform holders like Apple and Google and so on for the smaller guys if they can't find their ways in, if we just see a game that we personally like. And, and you know, I, I guess there's this a very strong belief that, you know, uh, you know, success uh, will like lift like everybody. So it's, it's not a zero sum game. And I, it's very true. Like I remember like when we were starting, uh, the fact that Rovio was so successful was of a massive benefit for us. It made like raising money so much easier because we could point out to a success from Helsinki. And then I'm of course, I'm hoping that our success then has inspired others and helped others. Uh, it's got a lot more competitive than it was when you started. Could you start Supercell now, and would you, with what you know? I think you, you could, and I, I, I certainly would. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Of course, it's, it's more competitive these days. In, and, 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 and by the way, I, I wouldn't start Supercell doing exactly what we do. So, so uh, uh, like, meaning like, the, like exactly the type of games that we've already done. I, but I, but I, I think if you put together a, like a small group of great developers and you start to work on something that doesn't really exist in the market yet, I think there are still a lot of possibilities there. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's, it's harder these days than it, than it was when we started. So we, we were, as I said, we were very lucky like with the timing and everything. So it's harder, but it's, it's, it's definitely not impossible in, in my opinion. It's obviously one thing having your own company culture when you're an independent business, but you have had obviously two different owners. You've got SoftBank and now you've got Tencent. How do you maintain that culture when you have pressure from someone who's outside who might have a completely different culture to you and has completely different expectations? So, so for us, like especially when we, uh, so, so we, we've sort of been lucky like uh, like, like since we became successful, we've had the luxury that, because we, we've never been into this situation where we would need to take somebody on board. We've never been into a situation where we have to raise money. Like since we did our series A with Axel Partners, like we haven't really raised money for, for, for the company. We've done these like secondary transactions uh, for various reasons, but not to raise money for the company. And, uh, and only because we've kind of found people who we feel that they are very aligned with. And, and then you, uh, like, and, 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 in, and it's also the case with both SoftBank and Tencent that, that, that it's, it's, it's not only that, you know, we feel that they are very, very aligned with those guys or they're aligned with SoftBank and, and, uh, and are very aligned with Tencent, but, uh, but you know, we've also like make, made sure that we kind of protected our interests like from sort of a, like in, in the contractual terms as, as well. So, uh, so, uh, like both with SoftBank and now with Tencent, like it, it really is the sort of the, the founders 
of the company and all the super salients who have like in practice who have control of the of the company and and you know this uh, and you know both softbank and tens and they are like smart enough companies that they understand that a company like ours they you know it, it really does not i mean if they if they would start to mess up with the culture they would destroy the most valuable thing that exists about supercell i mean then you know they're they in that if they did that their investment would be a really bad one so uh so uh actually like i we we haven't faced any pressures like whatsoever like not from softbank not from tencent uh on on, on this so uh so uh, I, I guess they've sort of been uh, lucky lucky in that sense but i but i would give an advice to everybody like like if if you raise raise vc money like of course you get great help and, and advice like from the best investors like i for example i say that they were very lucky to have like for example london venture partners on board and, and they were super helpful for us in the in the early days but yet at the end of the day don't forget that it's your company at the end of the day it's your company you are the founders and you should decide uh, on on matters that relate to culture i mean and no one nobody else knows it better than you do so uh, that's important to keep in keep in mind and I, I would argue that that all the best investors that I know, like they, they completely understand that that's the case. Clash Royale was like really innovative, and it seems like during production you empower the teams a lot. I wondered where the original ideas come from. Do you have internal game jams on your offsite, or yeah. how does it work? Uh, that's a that's a fantastic question, and there's a really great story about this. So most people don't know that actually. Class Royale, like early on, was inspired by this internal prototype. I think it, they called it the Summoners. It was uh, developed by a, a guy who's still with us, a guy called John Francis at the time. And, and uh, he developed that prototype before Clash of Clans came out. Uh, and and, uh, and that, that, at that time, I, I still remember this discussion, like somebody, it was probably me, said in the room that yeah you know this real time uh, pvp it won't ever work so <laughs> let's just let's just forget this and and uh, and, and so and, and you know it didn't get sort of full, i mean and then like clash came out heyday came out you know they were so busy with everything that they have had had on in our hands so we didn't do do anything that prototype but then like many years later like two of the founders a guy called uh, nico and, and and visa they they kind of like they, they took this prototype and used it as an inspiration and then they developed something that the code name I think was scroll and and, and again as I, as I just told you like uh, like the, the first versions like most people just wanted to kill the, the, the prototype and again you know not so much excitement but then like a few others like believed in the game they joined the scroll team and then they did this bigger prototype and I still remember like this day I, I went to the lunch kind of cafeteria area and, and it was literally impossible to talk in this lunch area about anything else but scroll. Like it, it, you could just feel the excitement in the, in the lunch area. And, and, then, uh, and, and then there was like some, some changes in the, in, in the team composition. And then in the end, they, and they were like looking for like what would be the right theme for the game. And then somebody suggested that, hey, you know, don't we have the perfect theme in, in, in Clash of Clans, actually. And, and you know, it would fit this, this game mechanic just perfectly. Uh, and, and then the, the, they decided to adopt it, and that was the birth of Clash Royale as, as we know it today. What might Supercell learn from Pokemon Go in terms of quality, in terms of augmented reality, and in terms of licensing and branding? Huge amount, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it's a fan fantastic game, and it's been like so, so inspiring to you know, see the success of that game. I, I think it has taken the mobile game to whole whole different level and, and you know it just like proves like what is the true size and potential on on this market and you like launch something like super innovative and and you have of course a strong brand to 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 to, to support it so uh and and you know like just think about it like uh, like thanks to pokemon go like so many people new people have probably like tried more like this type of mobile gaming for the first time in their life and and you know uh, and, and it's going to be hopefully so much easier for the next uh, company to do, say, AR game, to, 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 to release it, like, th thanks to the success of that, that game. I, I, I think the, the, the sort of the, the learning for us and everybody is that, you know, you know, instead of, like, copying what everybody else is doing, try something different. Uh, and, and, you know, be brave, you know, innovate. 
uh, and, and, you know, just put, it, put the game out. I mean, everybody knows that how many... I mean, obviously, they probably didn't expect it to be that successful as, as it was. And, and it, I'm sure all the other Pokemon Go players, like in addition to myself, have experienced these server issues and so on. But it really hasn't prevented the game to be massively successful. And, of course, the team is working hard to fix those. So uh, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of... Uh, uh, lessons for the for the whole industry, and, it, and frankly, I think it is inspiring. It's it's really great that somebody comes in and and you know raises the bar for for the rest of us. So that's fantastic. You've got characters in your games, and you have worlds. Are there other stories to be told about those things outside games? I'm sure you could have done a TV thing or a film, but you haven't. Is that just deliberate decision, or do you think there might be some potential for non-game stuff? Uh, I, I I certainly think there is potential, and, and obviously this has been a sort of a hot topic for us, uh, especially with Clash of Clans and, and, and the characters in, in, in there. And, and, and they've even like done, done something, so if you guys have check out, for example, a, a website called Clash Arama, so, uh, so we're actually working with uh, three original writers of this, the Simpsons TV show to create like Clash uh, related content, so comics and, and, and animations and so on, and which, which I think are great. Uh, and, uh, and and you know there may be something else coming coming like from that front, uh, but but you know like still like the most important thing for us again is is that value of focus and quality and try to be like laser focused on on just making the games better. Uh, so and, and then that combined with the small size of the team and, and the company really like limits what we what we can can do even though there's been like all kinds of interesting interesting ideas but but I, uh, I would say that still like uh, this year you'll see a bit more from us uh, from that side but you know we, we, uh, again like we, we, we are not gonna go crazy and do all kinds of things we are, we are gonna do a very few things but whatever then comes out I, I hope our players will really really like it and think it's like really authentic to the brand and of, of just high high quality. I just want to thank Ilka very much again. Please join me in thanking him for this fantastic. Thank you. Day.